Okay. So here's a system diagram of the New Horizons spacecraft. There are a lot of subsystems here where the thermal subsystem is in red at the bottom left. It mostly interacts with the power distribution system because the thermal control system needs to be supplied power to contribute active heating. Um, but otherwise, there are some passive solutions to a thermal control system um, that don't necessarily need power or are just mounted to a structure. But here is just some example of the thermal subsystem in context of the larger spacecraft subsystem. So I've kind of mixed up the structure of the subsystem lead. So the subsystem lead, which is the technologist, the engineer who's working on it, and the subsystem spacecraft role. So we'll just walk through kind of interweave the process of designing a thermal subsystem with what the thermal subsystem ultimately needs to do. So first, the thermal subsystem lead needs to collate the thermal sensitivities and require temperature ranges of all spacecraft components. This is going to be your lab of the week where you go through the different data sheets and we have three of the, the components here where we have the GPS unit, and I've just screenshotted the operating temperature and storage temperature. We have the Hope RF radio also here, and that spec is extracted from the data sheet and also for the batteries. So that's the first activity you're going to do as a thermal engineer. Once you have all of these temperature ranges, you can make this kind of chart where you have your items in the first column, you have your lower limit and your upper limit. And you can make a bar chart that shows the, um, the ranges of the specific components to find out which of these components have the strictest range. So you can see here moving down uh, the red space are temperatures that the component is not comfortable in. And so you definitely do not want to approach that region or like reside in that region. And then the black bar, sorry, the white bar is acceptable. The black bar is what the thermal engineer predicts the component will, will vary in between. So let's go down and see what the sensitive components are. There's this LCT which stands for um, liquid combustion thump something. Um, it has to do with, I would say, propulsion. Um, and then let's keep on looking down. The propulsion system is very sensitive. And so is the very last line, which is the battery. So these are the components that will drive your thermal subsystem. Um, these are the most sensitive components, so you'll probably have to focus on attaching um, active cooling or warming systems, or you'll make sure that your geometric placement within the spacecraft doesn't oscillate very much. The spacecraft subsystem is responsible for regulating the thermal interaction with the space environment and to reject heat to space or absorb, absorb it as necessary. Here we have an image of a spacecraft and the different interactions with the space environment that it incurs. So when it comes to absorbing heat, the spacecraft absorbs solar radiation, albedo, which is indirect solar radiation, um, and also Earth's inherent radiation. The spacecraft has the option to radiate its own heat into space. Um, and space is very cold. Uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation is around 3 Kelvin. And you can use that as a black body that you're 
transmitting your heat into. And just one, one more thing about this. Um, even though space is cold, vacuum is an insulator, a thermal insulator. So it's really not clear if your spacecraft is going to be too hot, too cold. There are nuances to this whole balance um, that we need to pay attention to. It's really not clear from the get-go um, whether you need heaters or coolers. OK. Um, another subsystem responsibility is to distribute sensors throughout the spacecraft to ensure that you know how hot or cold your components are. Um, to make sure that they stay within a required range. So here I have an image on the right of, here are some thermal sensors that are embedded into a heat shield. Now this was a very notable engineering event when it happened. Um, we were sending another rover to Mars, but we didn't know if the heat shield was sufficient, if it was too heavy, um, because we had always over-designed the heat shields to make sure that it survived the entry, descent, and landing, but maybe it was too thick. So the idea behind these sensors is to gather information about the survivability of the heat shield so that in future missions, um, you could design the heat shields to a more optimal thickness and therefore mass, which, which saves on cost. So this particular example was like a, a really a pinnacle engineering feat, but in concept, it's just, you put sensors on there. You wanna make sure that the spacecraft is safe, um, that everything behaves as expected. Um, here is a more detailed breakdown of where these sensor locations are relative to the heat shield. Okay, um, as a subsystem lead, you'll have to select components and locations to attach temperature sensors onto to monitor the health of these components and the thermal profile of the entire spacecraft. You'll also have to pay attention to complexity, reliability, and use of resources like power and mass. So here is New Horizons thermal subsystem, more Geometrically, it's CAD version um, displayed here with the labeled components. So you notice there are some radiators, thermal shields. Um, this thermal shield is to protect from the radiation of this RTG. This RTG has an isolating mount. Because it's so warm, um, you can have things called isolators, which cut off the heat transfer from a hot spot to a cold spot. There's something called MLI, multi-layer insulation, that we'll talk about in the um, technologies lecture. There's a shunt, um, thermal couples, more radiators, thermally coupled tank, a louvre, which is kind of like thermal shutters. Another radiator. Yeah, so there are a ton of these little thermal controls distributed across the spacecraft. Okay, um, next, a subsystem responsibility is to control the temperature of the spacecraft and its components by directing the flow of thermal energy toward or away from components through conduction and radiation. So this is a very special case. I know here it says conduction and radiation, but on the ISS, they have a ammonia coolant loop which uses convection as well. Um, typically, that is not the case. Smaller spacecraft do not have the privilege of having enough volume or mass where we can justify some convective um, heat transfer mechanism 
but the ISS is so big, it generates so much heat that it is necessary. So let's just look at typical thermal control flow. Um, there is some interaction with the environment and you can either reject that heat or you can manage that heat by either storing it um, and then that storage can be collected in a certain spot. It can be transported to a different spot or it can be rejected. So that's generally um, your options when it comes to handling heat. And then here, let's just talk about how the ISS controls their temperature. So the ISS actually runs pretty warm. The solar panels are very large and they generate a lot of electrical energy. The pods, the command modules, um, they have a lot of electronics within them to support the humans inside, to support the science experiments. So because we're generating so much energy and we're using so much of that energy, the electronics, the humans, they get really hot. They dissipate a lot of heat. So you need to direct that heat away from the modules using coolant loops um, and radiators. Yeah, I think I summarized that pretty well. Okay, and another subsystem lead is to produce thermal control algorithms or policies for active thermal control systems. So we talked about the hardware that can control different components, but the thermal subsystem lead also needs to think about the logic behind these control algorithms. Um, this logic comes in the form of code, like if statements. If this component is too warm, then initiate cooling system. If the system is too cool, initiate the warming system. So here I have, um, this is a Mercury ECLIS, which stands for Environment Control and Life Support System Schematic. And it shows heat exchangers and evaporative cooling components. So it not only has active heating, it also has active cooling to make sure that the human on board, the astronaut, is comfortable. Um, so how do you control these components? You'll see here that there is a temperature profile. So temperature over time of the, um, of the suit temperature, where there is bound to be some control in there where you detect that you're going into darkness. So you project that you're going to be cooling. Um, so maybe you wanna put on some heaters. Uh, in daylight, you know that you're going to get warm from the sun. So maybe you start your cooling system. So I just wanted to show you um, maybe some of the logic behind this that, you know, you have your hardware, but you also need to back it up with some control policies, which is an area of research that I'm into. Uh, okay. Oh, here it is. Temperature limits within the cabin and within the suit were regulated by regulating cooling fluid flow rate. Yes, okay. Um, subsystem lead responsibilities. Models the thermal profile of the spacecraft within a space environment conducts analysis on a finite element model to ensure all components cycle in a safe and operable thermal range. We've already talked about finite element analysis um, and back when we talked about it, we discussed how you can use it for heat transfer studies. So here's just a sample spacecraft with its different nodes and elements broken out. Um, here's the thermal distribution if you apply some boundaries and conditions on what the spacecraft is experiencing. So yeah, it just kind of seems like there's a hot side and there are cooler sides. Um, but you want to know to the specificity of these different nodes because you want to know what temperature components are at, not just the general spacecraft. <laughs> 
Okay, the subsystem lead also oversees the thermal development and environmental testing with the characteristics. Um, your environmental tests will define the number of thermal cycles, how long you'll dwell in that temperature, the temperature range, the extremes, the transition rate, and the thermal stability. So these are all pictures taken from a NASA JPL presentation where they were talking about best practices for, uh, for development and environment testing. We've got a thermal vacuum chamber. We've got a profile of the kind of test that they are going to run, where you'll see um, here, the peaks and troughs signify the cycles that it's going through. The x-axis is time, so dwell time is how long it lingers in that extreme temperature. The temperature extremes are what are the maximum and minimum temperatures. Uh, the transition rate is that how quickly do we go from an extreme to the next extreme. Um, and I don't think I can say much about thermal stability with these plots. Um, but the thermal development testing happens between PDR and CDR. There's some assembly qualification testing. And then there's the entire system testing. So you put an integrated spacecraft into a thermal vacuum chamber right before you ship it out. 